So why is this? Why is it, just to come back to the nature of science, that it doesn't seem to behave as a public good? Well, actually, just think, just for a second, about how difficult it is, really, to access science that isn't, isn't your own. Let's forget contemporary science. Let's go to really, really old science. Science is 100 years old, you know, back in the dark ages when it was pretty simple and straightforward. Let's look at uh, Einstein's theories of relativity. Now, those papers now are 100 years old. I mean, we're talking about really primitive science. How many people in this room could understand those papers? Oh, you can. Bits and pieces. Bits and pieces. Thank you. Sorry? <laughs> he wasn't, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you can. But I think you'll agree that it's not that really available to most people. Absolutely not. And I'm afraid it's the same with all bits of science and technology. Actually, it's impenetrable, except to people who are in very closely related fields. So closely related that an economist called Mansfield actually did the maths. He said he took 100 companies in the New England states in the 80s, and he looked at a large number of innovations that had gone from one com company to another. So company A had invented something, and he calculated the costs to company B of copying it. The real costs. How much did it actually cost? And the costs were 65%. So competitor companies cost them 65% to copy an innovation that it cost the first company to do the research. But that's just the direct marginal costs. On top of that, the competitor company needs to have invested the sunk costs in employing the scientists and technologists and researchers and engineering facilities and labs in the first place. And on top of that, it had to equip those scientists with, the, with um, budgets so they can go to conferences, budgets so they can actually read journals and subscribe to journals, and indeed, with their own research projects. Because if you're not doing research in that field, you simply cannot acquire the information of another paper because you're not actually equipped to read that paper. Because much of the knowledge is, of course, tacit knowledge. Add the direct marginal, add the, the direct marginal cost of acquiring an innovation from a competitor company, which is mainly the tacit knowledge of just rediscovering with your own hands, literally how it works to the sunk costs of employing the scientists in the first place and the research projects they have to do so they can understand the field, and the costs of copying, not surprisingly, work out as 100%. Because that's the equilibrium position you'd expect, actually, in an economy. You'd expect an economy to titrate itself such that the cost of copying would be the same as the costs of innovation, because otherwise no one would innovate. And to use a circular argument, companies spend a great deal of money on innovation, up to 3% of GDP, actually are spent by advanced economies on R&D, and if the government doesn't spend any money, say in Japan or Switzerland, where it doesn't, then 3% of GDP is being spent by companies solely to do R&D. So we know, therefore, with this, this huge private funding of R&D, that in equilibrium, the cost of copying and the cost of innovation must equilibrate, because otherwise you wouldn't be in equilibrium and your economy wouldn't have settled at that figure. So it is, in fact, a complete myth that science and R&D are publicly available, freely available. There is no evidence that it's so, and all the evidence is that it's not. So, why do people believe the story and the theory? Why is it that however many times you try to dispute it, you are laughed out of court? Well, first of all, of course, there's always anecdote. You know, where would we be without the World Wide Web, invented by Tim Berners-Lee, at CERN. Government funded project gave us the web. Clearly, without the government, we would still be using quill pens and vellum, and we just wouldn't have the advantage of the web. Now, this is an argument that's very hard unless you're, you know, but let us actually consider another case in point, because I'm going to come straight back to Tim Berners Lee and the web and CERN. Think of the aeroplane. Now, the aeroplane, as we all know, was invented by the Wright brothers in 1903. And they spent $1,000 of their own money, and they flew, kitty, they flew um, uh, uh, Aeroplane 1, whatever it's called, 
in, uh, in Kitty Hawk in Carolina, where it was, and they discovered the airplane. At the same time, there was a research project, funnily enough, conducted by the Smithsonian Institution, funded by the government, the American government, to the tune, then a lot of money, of $47,000, which was then increased, so it became about $63,000. And the reason for this, by the way, was the Spanish-American War. The Smithsonian Institution had gone to Washington and said, you've got all these bad people in Cuba that you're quite rightly trying to kill, in the preparation to the Iraq War, I expect, um, and you could kill them so much more effectively if you bombed from the air, so why don't we invent you an airplane? And the American Congress thought this was an extremely enlightened argument, and gave the Smithsonian $67,000 in order to invent the aeroplane. As it turned out, the Wright brothers did it first. Imagine, though, if the Wright brothers hadn't. Imagine that the Smithsonian had actually got there first, and it was a race, by the way. The Smithsonian may never have flown the aeroplane, because every time they tried to fly it, it, it crashed, but you could imagine that they might have flown an aeroplane. They weren't stupid. We'd all go around saying, well, buff the American government, we'd all still be in horses and buggies. Only the beneficent and genius of the American government has given us the aeroplane. Where would we be without the American government? But we have, actually, the experiment, because we know the Wright brothers got there first. But no one ever goes around saying, the one thing we mustn't do is fund governments fund science, because that crowds out the Wright brothers. For some reason, that argument is never legitimate. And so the Wright brothers inventing the aeroplane independently of the state is somehow discounted as a historical accident. But when Tim Berners-Lee at CERN does it, oh well, we wouldn't be without it. Just to come back to CERN and Tim Berners-Lee, um, it is absolutely true that he made a fantastic observation. He came up with a very nice algorithm. And, but the reason he did it was the what was then called, we don't use this language anymore, what we then called distributed computer, or distributing computing, was a technology whose time was undoubtedly coming. And the bigger the activities you were engaged in, such as CERN, the more likely you were eventually to make the breakthrough that you needed for distributed computing. What you have to do is ask yourself, CERN is an exceptionally expensive project, costing billions, and you have to work out, and it's a complicated equation that can be done, what would have happened if we hadn't funded CERN? But A, that money would have been back in the economy, so there'd have been you know, productive use of that economy, because we know that only primarily funded R&D actually translates into economic growth. And therefore, you have to assume that Berners-Lee would have actually been employed by Unilever or ICI, and would have made his discovery in a related but similar, if, if suddenly, technically different context. What happened to history on the government funding of science is totally anecdotal. All of American productivity and creativity before 1940 was produced by the private sector. No one ever says. It's extraordinary. Thank God the private sector produces all this R&D. But since 1940, governments have moved into R&D, displaced the private sector for R&D. Underlying rates of economic growth have not increased. Underlying rates of total activity to productivity have not increased. But obviously discoveries have been made. And everyone says, well, without the government it wouldn't have been made. It's a, it's a non sequitur. And that is the text. And that is the context because people assume that science is a public good. And what this shows is the devastating power of ideas. And people are very, very bad at handling ideas. You tell people that science is a public good, and whatever the evidence is, it's a public good, as always. And therefore, and, and that is what you're up against when you're dealing with science.